Okay, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. And once again, thank you for joining us on our California Nevada chat here on Friday, uh, May 7th. Uh, we're particularly excited this morning to have as our guests, uh, Mark Eddies, Brad Merrick, and Stuart Smith, all PGA members here in the Northern and Southern California sections. And uh, our goal is to celebrate them as we're headed to the PGA Championship in Kiowa. Uh, which will be contested uh, two weeks from yesterday. First round will be two weeks from yesterday. So uh, also we're uh, excited as well and thankful for Craig Kessler to be here, Director of Government Affairs for the Southern California Golf Association. Uh, we have a couple of things to talk about there. Uh, Craig, at a minimum, will discuss uh, hopefully Assembly Bill 672 and 1346. So uh, as members of the California Alliance for Golf, CAG, we do the best we can to stay on top of those issues. And there's nobody better than Craig and Kevin Fitzgerald of keeping those informed, keeping us informed. Uh, thanks to our partners, the team in Southern California, Tom Addis, Executive Director, Chief Executive Officer, Nikki Gatch, Assistant Executive Director and Chief Operating Officer, and Jeff Johnson, Chief Financial Officer, Production Team, uh, Bryce C. Doyle and Tyra Miller, that that we get to you uh, right now as we've moved to once a month. So we're, we're glad to still be on the air. Uh, our leadership team, Northern California PGA President, Didi Moriarty, Southern California President, uh, Robin Shelton. So a little bit on the news, you know, we have mixed, mixed news regarding COVID. And I say mixed in the sense of the crisis going on in India uh, right now, very, very unfortunate. And, and we, we hope that it does get resolved. I believe another vaccine has been approved and uh, for distribution in India, you know, got 1.2 billion people there, uh, just a daunting task. And yet we continue to have, and we're grateful for openings here in California and Nevada. Uh, signs along the way are certainly the city of San Francisco moving to the yellow tier and the ability to gather in Nevada uh, up to 250 people, which we're uh, again, thankful for. So we can hold, uh, begin to hold some of our, our meetings and of course, uh, for all of us here in California, the continued commitment of Governor Newsom, from Governor Newsom, uh, to open the state on June 15th. And uh, uh, hopefully Craig will uh, discuss that as well. So uh, let's kick off and start our, our Friday chat and celebration with Northern California PGA President uh, Didi Moriarty. Didi? Yeah, oh, thanks, Sled. Um, hello, everybody. I was glad I could uh, call in today just to say hello, wish everybody a wonderful weekend, and uh, especially to say uh, congratulations to uh, Brad and Stuart and Mark. Uh, congratulations, you guys. I hope you play great and enjoy the experience. We're going to be rooting for you. And uh, you're representing California well. So uh, everybody have a great day. I'm off to work, uh, teaching all day. So um, looking forward to seeing you again. Okay, thank you, Didi. And uh, good luck today. <clears throat> Enjoy a beautiful Friday. Hope it's nice and clear in the city. And now to Southern California Executive Director, Chief Executive Officer, Mr. Tom Addis. Tom? Yeah, good morning. Thanks, Lanny. Good morning, everybody. And on behalf of our President, Robin Shelton, it's uh, great to be here on a Friday and uh, on our first of uh, uh, our once a month series now. And we appreciate everybody being here. And we look forward to this morning uh, with Mark and Brad and, and Stuart uh, and how exciting, uh, how excited they must be, not to put any, any words in their mouth, but how excited they must be. And uh, I know I'm excited to uh, uh, travel to uh, Kiowa. First time in over a year on an airplane, uh, so a little bit apprehensive, but at the same time, uh, feel confident with what's going on out there. I was with my doctor, had a doctor's appointment yesterday afternoon, and uh, he's extremely confident. Uh, as long as people, uh, us, all of us, uh, continue to wear our face coverings, continue to do the distancing, he's, uh, he's very, very confident uh, that uh, other than the situations in the rest of the world, he's very confident in the United States that, uh, uh, that we will be uh, in fine health uh, coming, especially coming up uh, into the fall. So that was exciting to hear him say that. So we, we continue to talk about COVID and, and how important it is for our everyday life. So uh, again, thanks for what all of you are doing uh, to help that. 
And again, uh, Len, uh, look forward to listening to Mark and, and uh, Brad and Stuart, and look forward to seeing you you three in, at Kiowa. Uh, that'll be a lot of fun and, uh, uh, and watching you hit a few shots. So Len, thanks. Yeah, Tom. And the idea would be to watch them hit as few shots as possible, right? As few uh, as possible. Be great. <laughs> great, so let, let's, let's start with Brad. Uh, Brad Merritt. Brad has, was elected to PGA membership in November of 2019. Is currently a director of instruction at Carica Park uh, here in Alameda. And uh, Kiowa will be Brad's first PGA. And Brad's finished as a runner-up in our 2021 Match Play Championship uh, just about a month ago, and was also runner-up in our 2020 Stroke Play Championship. Uh, Brad's a three-time NCAA Academic All-American in Indiana as well as the Illinois Junior Champion at uh, age 18 and the regular division amateur champion at uh, age 21. So uh, Brad, congratulations. And uh, your, your thoughts about your road to the PGA and, and uh, the event at the PGA National just uh, last week. Yeah, thanks. Uh, super excited, obviously, to get the opportunity to play, you know, any tour event, let alone a major. Um, so. Uh, over the moon with that uh, was, you know, as Mark and Stuart, I'm sure could attest to, it was not easy down in Florida. Um, although Stuart made it look easy the last day. Um, it was yeah, maybe the first five holes of the 72 event I got with minimal wind. But then after that, it was 15 to 20 miles an hour on, you know, pretty much the rest of the week. Um, and on a golf course that I wasn't honestly super comfortable on. So um, played really well the first two days and then not as well kind of the last two days, but was able to hang in there and, uh, and keep battling and come out with one of the spots. So, uh, Brad, what are, what are your thoughts now and your timeline with Kiwa? One, have you played uh, Kiwa previously? And uh, it, it, in your, your plan to get there, practice, warm up, and, and also do the best you can to relax as well? Uh, so my plan, I've talked to, you know, try to talk to as many people as I can could who've had uh one of my friends in the bay area is pat hurst um, who obviously has plenty of major championship experience on the on the ladies side um, and just talking to some other friends that have played in their you know first or second majors and they all said kind of to a t that you know they overdid it the monday tuesday wednesday right before the event and kind of ran out of gas the, the thursday and friday so i'm getting down there uh kind of eight days before so i can get a lot of prep work in on the course, uh, try to get some, some good practice in then so that I don't feel like I have to do a lot Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, where I can just play nine holes and, and take it easy um, and try to rest up as much as possible so that, um, cause hopefully, hopefully it'll be a long week. Um, you know, hopefully, hopefully all three of us are playing four days. So, um, you know, just try to pace myself more than anything where I'm not packing too much in a couple of days right before the event. All right. So, Brad, is there any? How does Kiowa, to to your knowledge, match up with your game, and what parts I, do you feel would be the most important? Um, I mean, obviously, a super long golf course, uh, seventy six hundred yards, I believe. Um, so, got been kind of tweaking with some some higher launch long irons, uh, the two, three, and four, the last couple of days, uh, just to try to get ready because I know I'm kind of a lower ball hitter, uh, and I'm sure the greens are going to be pretty firm. So. Uh, try to tweak with some equipment and see if that, uh, see if I can get those launching a little bit higher, coming down a little bit softer um, to help me on some of the longer par threes and some of the long par fours out there. Brad, great. No, we, we have uh, certainly uh, some COVID restrictions and people just, just generally held, uh, hesitant one way or another in traveling, but do you have some uh, friends and family that are going to join you uh, at Kiowa? I'll be there. Tom will be there. We'll certainly be there uh, following you around. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Fortunately have, uh, I think a pretty good group of people coming out. Uh, my wife's going to come out, uh, probably about a dozen people from, I'm originally from Chicago. Um, so probably about a dozen people from Chicago are going to make the trip. Um, and then a handful of other people from kind of all parts of the country. Uh, we got the same guy in my bag, uh, who caddied for me in Florida. Um, so he's going to come out, uh, with his family as well. Uh, so looking forward to, you know, it's been, Prior to going to Florida, I hadn't been on a plane in 14 months. So there's you know, going to be a lot of people there that I haven't seen uh, since pre-COVID. So, you know, excited for the PGA, but also really excited, uh, you know, that people are 
traveling down just to watch me play and uh, really excited to get a chance to see them. Which is very special, Brad. And, you know, another another distinct part of golf, I think, when, when people come, how close they, we can actually get to each other. You know, again, putting COVID aside for a moment, just being right up against the ropes and supporting. Uh, is your caddy going to do any front work, Brad? Is he going to uh, uh, get there a little earlier and start taking notes? Or have you, have you worked that out? Uh, he's going to get down there. So my first day on property will be the Wednesday, you know, eight days before. Uh, and he's going to get down there, I believe, on Saturday. Um, so I'll get a few days in, uh, my wife's gonna, I'm bringing a small bag for the first few days. My wife's going to carry that around, uh, for the first couple days, uh, and kind of do the prep work by myself. And then he'll be there with plenty of time to kind of talk through a lot of stuff and, uh, and see the course plenty of times as well. Okay. Well, Brad, thank you. And, uh, thanks for your time again. Congratulations on, on qualifying. You know, I talked with Stuart yesterday and I remember him saying that, Stuart, I think that on your first PGA, you didn't sleep for about a couple months before that one. So I <laughs> hope you're getting some sleep, hope you're getting some rest. And uh, we certainly look forward to, uh, to you representing the flag of the state of California, Northern California PGA, and, and we'll be right there with you at Kiowa. For sure. Thanks. And then actually a little fun fact, Mark and I were actually in, I don't know, I think it was level three, but it might've been level two. Mark and I were in the same level two or three class in Florida uh you know pre pre covid so it was funny to see a familiar face there of the of the group of 20 that qualified mm -hmm. so great and uh something you'll always you'll always remember yeah for sure but thanks thanks for taking the time today Lynn. I appreciate it yeah thanks brad and then of course we hope you can stay uh, if you do have to leave we certainly understand that but hope you can uh, stay on with us yeah. cool thanks brad thanks guys Okay, next up, Mark Gettys. Mark, good morning. Uh, and uh, Mark is a UK native, a graduate of Grand Canyon University uh, in Phoenix. And Mark was elected to membership in 2020 and currently assistant golf professional at uh, Coronado Golf Course, and uh, of which there were three participants in the, in the PPC this year, uh, Brian Smock and Tim Perun uh, as well. And... Uh, Mark is a 2018 Southern California PGA, 2018 and 19 Associate Player of the Year. In 2018, had one first place finish and six top tens. In 2019, two first place finish and five top tens. And, and in 2020, uh, two first place finishes again with 11 uh, top tens. So Mark just better and better. Uh, was the first section championship in 2020, just a year ago. And already, already three wins uh, this year in 2021. So, Mark, well done. Uh, nice to see you. Nice to meet you. And certainly, uh, congratulations on uh, heading to Kiowa with Brad and Stuart. Uh, uh, very special, I'm sure. And Mark, a little bit about uh, your journey, please. Yeah, so it's been kind of interesting. Um, obviously, I came over to California from Arizona in 2017. Um, I was uh, hired here at Coronado Golf Course. And didn't know much about the staff at the time. And then I found out that obviously Brian was the head pro and then, you know, kind of did a deep dive into his background and his playing background and found out what, what a good player he was. And, and then later that year, he qualified for his first PGA championship. So that was kind of the catalyst um, to getting me into the program, getting me going uh, into this kind of, um, into this kind of, into this kind of line of golf, I guess, um, after playing, you know, competitively uh, for a few years. So that was kind of awesome to, to watch him do that and see how successful he was um, qualifying for two PGAs back-to-back uh, -back years. So so that was pretty cool to just experience that and then kind of use that as my motivation to, to get through the program pretty quickly. Uh, it took me about just over two years to, do, to get all three levels done and, and then kind of you know qualify through the section level to the, the national level and then obviously to the PGA Championship. So Mark, tell, tell us about any familiarity with Kiowa and, you know, if so, what do you remember? If not, what are your plans and, and how do you uh, uh, expect to approach it? You know? Yeah, so I've never, never been there. Um, I will get down there probably the Sunday before, just kind of take it easy, play, play a round or two, and then have a light day Wednesday, um, just some fine tuning, uh, not, not kind of too strenuous. Um, the course, I guess it's, it's long uh, from what I, from what I understand, it's, it's brutal. I listened to a podcast the other day about the 91 Ryder cup, uh, which obviously just built, you know, earlier that year. 
Um, and you know, from, from all accounts, it was uh, it was brutal back then, and it still is. Um, so just looking forward to the test. Um, it's going to be extremely challenging, but obviously, you know, it's a great it's a great great accomplishment to get this far. Um, I don't plan on just making the the numbers. Um, I plan on playing well and representing Southern California and the state of California well. Um, so just overall, really excited them to to get there. Um, Obviously, we're still 10 days out, but we're still still got some prep work to do, still got some fine tuning to, to figure out. But, you know, we're obviously getting closer now and it's it's definitely on the horizon. Yeah, certainly, uh, Mark, certainly is a, a great accomplishment and um, nothing short of that in 1999, right? The War by the Shore uh, was the name of that Ryder Cup. And so that's a clue. And uh, as you mentioned, you know, long and brutal, great combination, Mark. So as as you, you you talk about that, how does that match up with with your game and your possible approach? Well, you know, my name my game's not really going to change between now and then. I feel like I'm just going to try and hit fairways, try and hit greens, and you know, try and try and execute to the best of my ability. Um, I feel like if I'm executing and hitting the shots I'm trying to hit, um, then I'll have success. Um, obviously, I'm not naive enough to. So I think I'm going to go there, you know, contend right away. But obviously, you know, we just want to hit the first tee shot, hit it pretty solid, hopefully find the fairway, go find it, hit it again. Um, just trying to keep that kind of singular focus throughout the whole the whole week. Um, try and not let the moment be too big. It is just another golf tournament. So obviously, it's, it's a massive golf tournament, but, you know, we're still playing golf. Um, just the object is still to get the ball in the hole and as few shots as possible. Uh, Mark, that's great. And as I asked Brad, um, did you have some family here or back in the UK? And will we have some uh, followers uh, at Kiowa? Yeah, so my wife and uh, we, we just have a seven month old. Um, he's going to come. Um, so we're going to hang out kind of that week. Um, I have a couple of friends coming in from Phoenix that I went to college with. Um, they're going to hang out. And then obviously I have my caddy, who's another assistant here. He's going to come and he's going to come and loop for me. Um, so we're just going to have a good time, kind of keep it small. We're going to rent a little house about 30 minutes away, just to try and avoid the, the hustle of it all and just try and relax through the tournament week. Mark, that's great. And and obviously, first off, again, congratulations on your success uh, so far in 21, uh, or, already three wins. And um, how do you see the rest of the year playing out? Obviously, you're off to a great start. Yeah, we're just trying to, you know, obviously we're super busy here at Coronado. We're just pumping out the golfers, just trying to find the time to, to do some practice and, and, and play a little. I am fortunate that my, you know, I can kind of schedule around my golf tournaments. So that's that's been huge. Um, the staff here at Coronado have been excellent and they continue to be very supportive. Um, for that, I'm very grateful. Um, but yeah, just looking forward to just, you know, having fun with golf and, you know, taking it away from what was previously my job to play golf and now kind of use it more as a, you know, as an outlet um, to play and make it more fun as opposed to kind of the strenuous task that was five, six years ago has been incredible. And I'm just trying, just trying to keep it fun and keep it light. Well, I think you've got an advantage, Mark, in, in terms of keeping your game sharp, uh, having Brian right there, who's competed in many PPCs in the PGA, uh, and Tim as well. Do the three of you just uh, somehow sneak out for an afternoon and tee it up at Coronado? Yeah, it, it's tough when you've got 350 on the tee sheet almost every day to get out there and and, and play play a little. But you know, obviously, we're very supportive of each other. And you know, when I, when one of us is playing in a golf tournament, the other two are definitely following along, keeping track. And you know, obviously, Tim just won a you know the, one of the, us one of our senior events last couple of days. Um, so, you know, we're excited for him and, um, just trying to keep tabs on each other, keep, keep, keep each other sharp and just have fun with it all. That's great, Mark. That's great. And I know Tom has a question, Tom. Yeah, real quickly. And, and, uh, first off, I, I happen to be, I'm old enough to happen to be at the war by the shore in 1991. So, uh, I have that to think back on it and it is a very, very difficult golf course. You guys will enjoy it uh and and putting the ball where it needs to be um kind of a follow-up uh, and a follow along mark uh you mentioned brian and then and then you were just talking about tim and, and brian and 
how how much that group of three, let's say, how much of an incentive uh, is that for you to keep keep your skills, keep keep sharp, uh, and especially leading into a PGA Championship to have that that support, that background, and that incentive. Yeah, it's pretty cool. It's it's less of um, the playing aspect. A lot of it was understanding how to manage my time and watching them last week kind of manage their time and kind of, you know, dilly dally in the morning when you've got a late tea time, kind of watch them, see how they kind of slow play the morning to make it not drag out. You know, that was interesting. You've got to get good at doing nothing for those late tea times. And, you know, you just pick up tricks and you pick up tips from these people who have done We've done this, you know, Brian's played countless four day tournaments and, you know, that's something we don't do very often is playing these four day tournaments. And, you know, it's a grind to get through day two to day three. And then obviously you've got an extra day that we don't normally have. It's, it's mentally, it's taxing and you just got to kind of keep yourself, keep yourself focused and having, you know, Brian and Tim who, who have a lot of experience just to look at and just to be like, okay, you know, kind of where do we go from here kind of thing has been really cool um just basically watching them and having a good time with them and you know picking their brains here and there obviously not trying to delve too deep because we are still competitive we are still trying to beat each other um but at some point you know there is that kind of you know um just everyone's trying to just learn from each other so although we are competitive we just try and bounce ideas off each other and not give away too many secrets yeah that's great great advice too and and having been there a number of times it's amazing to see how well you guys do on the golf course and and at the same time running that business at coronado so so good for you thanks thank you tom and thanks for for uh, saying 1991 i believe i said 99 that was brookline uh, of course so uh, mark again uh, congratulations and and final thoughts final thoughts from you yeah i'm just excited just trying to um trying to not hype it up too much um just trying to keep it keep it in the forefront of my mind but you know just at the end of the day just go out there with it and have have a good time um be excited um but still still understand that you know we're still there to compete we're not there to make up the numbers so just overall looking forward to the week um just just gonna have fun with that Great. Thank you, Mark. And congratulations on everything you're accomplishing this year and certainly getting to the PGA. Uh, safe travels for you and, and your family uh, to Kiowa, to South Carolina. And, uh, and we look forward to a great, great championship. So, so be safe. And thanks for being with us this morning. Of course. Uh, thank you guys for the time and the platform. Um, appreciate what you guys do with these chats. Um, keep them going. They're very informative and they help everybody out. So thank you great. for that. Thank you, Mark. Uh, next up, Stuart Smith. Uh, Stuart uh, was elected to PGA membership in 1996 and currently is director of golf at Somerset Country Club in Reno, uh, where we celebrate our four pro scramble following our uh, semi-annual meeting. It looks like we're going to be able to do it this year. So we're excited for that. This is Stuart's third PGA championship. And uh, he's also right after this headed to uh, Southern Hills, uh, competing in his sixth senior PGA championship and uh, in Tulsa, of course. Stuart has qualified for seven, but there was no championship uh, in 2020. Uh, has played in tw five tour events and was the NCPGA Golf Professional of the Year in 2016, our section stroke play champion twice and match play championship uh, one time. And uh, 2019 was so successful we have to say this, Stuart, right, that we did call it the summer of Stuart uh, because, because everyone seemed to be playing for second place. So, Stuart, again, congratulations on, on qualifying one more time um, and, you know, headed to the East Coast. So your thoughts so far on, on what to accomplish and what needs to get done between now and then. Well, thank you, Len. Uh, again, congratulations to, to Brad and Mark uh, for qualifying for their first one. I hope that's their first of many. Uh, my thoughts, well, I, it's all gravy to me at this point. You know, I, I didn't think I'd necessarily play in another PGA championship. You know, I'm certainly a competitor and I certainly enjoyed the competition. So I was able to fly in under the radar a little bit on that final round uh, where 
maybe guys were losing sleep the night prior. I was just a little bit in disappointment and sleeping pretty well after a poor third round and uh, got some got some of that weather that Brad talked about for his first five holes uh, on my first five holes and took advantage with with the sole intent just to get ready for Tulsa. You know, don't waste the day. Let's let's work things out, get ready for Tulsa and worked myself in the mix and was lucky to hang on. Uh, They're coming down the stretch and, and post a great round. So it's probably one of my best competitive rounds that I've played in, in quite a long time, if, if ever. So uh, excited to be going back, excited to be going to Kiowa. So Stuart, maybe that, maybe that third round rest had a lot to do with it. And, and for those that, that may not know or, or may know, Stuart did shoot 65 uh, in that final round, just, just catapulted you right into the uh, top 20. Uh, Stuart, because you were at the end of round three, sitting right on the cut line, uh, if I remember correctly. So as you're going through that final round, when did it occur to you? Uh, obviously playing very, very strong that um, we, we might get in here. Well, so yeah, I ended up being the biggest mover three days in a row, one like an elevator, once up, once down, once up. Uh, uh, I would say once I... T- once I birdied seven, which was a, a very gettable par five, if you hit a good drive. Uh, uh, once I went five under through seven, uh, put me one over for the tournament. I knew I was in the mix a little bit. I knew that, you know, I was at least on on the line. Uh, I actually told my playing partners, I said, "Oops, sorry guys, now I gotta, I'm I'm gonna maybe turn on to a little bit of a game face here, which." When you're teeing off first, you know, in one of those things, I was hoping to move up a few spots and maybe make uh, make 2,200 instead of 2,000, you know. Uh, so I three putted eight and then got back to four, but uh, probably the birdie on 10 when I went back to five under. That's certainly uh, knowing that I had a couple par fives left. Uh, that was an opportunity to possibly get there. But, you know, there, there was a lot of golf still left. The wind was at then, you know, blowing, you know, on the back nine, it was blowing for us as well, even though we were first off. Um, so I'd, I'd say right there, right there at 10, it was when I went 500 through 10 and went over for the tournament, knowing that I had number 16 in my back pocket, I, I knew where that pin was going to be. I played there enough in the national seniors uh, to know where the pins were going to be. And I knew it was going to be that front position. And if you had a good drive on 16, that front position was pretty gettable. So. I was able to skate through and, and make a couple pars on 17 and 18 and uh, both hard holes, uh, especially the, the length, you know, the length uh, playing in the, in the professional national championship was a lot different than playing in the senior national championship back there. So we had a, a number 14 playing 460, whatever, 468, number 17 playing 238 to the pin the last day. And, all my young counterparts are hitting irons and I'm, I'm taking two hybrids and four hybrids at everything. So, uh, I hung on, I, I stayed in the mix. Uh, and, and you do that, Stuart, that's not, certainly not the first time you've done that. So well done. So Stuart, as you think about Kiowa, uh, wh- what's the plan as, as the reputation of Kiowa? I'm not, I don't know if you've played there previously, but what's your thinking so far? Well, I haven't played there. I downloaded the app on my phone and I went through hole by hole and added the yardage up and it came out to 7,866. So I had to do it again to make sure I had the right yardage. So if it's 7,866 and they really decide to play it at that, I'm going to have a great time for five days. I'm going to play three practice rounds, really just nine holes one day. Uh, Count on playing a couple of nice rounds uh, with Kiwa with a couple of nice tour pros. And I just take it as it comes, you know, I'm going to compete. I'm not saying I'm not going to make it or not going to give up, but I'm not going to put any pressure on myself to say, Oh, I got to make the cut. I, I, I'm just, I'm going to enjoy the week at, at at being the second oldest competitor in the field. I I would imagine at 59, I'm just going to have a good week. I can't, I can't keep up at 7,800 yards. I know better. So I'm brushing off and polishing my fairway medals and my hybrids right now and my wedges and my putter. And I'm not really worried about uh, making cuts or missing cuts. I'm gonna put, the, like Mark, I'm gonna put the best numbers I can on the board. I'm not gonna figure out how to hit it as far as Bryson this week uh, to take that there. I mean, I gotta play my game. I gotta be me and 
if that means I, I shoot a 65 or a, a 78, I'm, I'm going to be happy just being there representing the PGA of America, representing my club, my family. Uh, it, it's a thrill. It's a, it's a thrill for me to go back and do it again. Yeah, no question, Stuart. And we know, we know, we know you're there for a reason, and that's because of your talent, which we'll show once again at Kiowa. So, Stuart, who, who will be coming along uh, to Kiowa? Well, it's exciting. I'll have my, uh, my wife would be with me. Uh, she made it to uh, my two prior ones, of course, Atlanta and uh, Rochester. Uh, my son, Parker, he's my youngest son. He's 20. He's going to caddy for me at the PGA. And my son, Jordan, caddy for me at Rochester in the PGA. So both my sons now will get a chance to caddy in a PGA championship. Uh, funny 2011, they both decided to go camping and they didn't want to even go. So uh, I'm making progress there. Uh, my older son is going to go, uh, Jordan. He's 24. He's getting married June 11th. So we're kind of a busy family right now doing lots of prep work in a lot of different areas. But Jordan will be back with me. And then he, he's going to caddy for me in Tulsa. So uh, that'd be nice. He's been on my bag before at the senior and he's been back, like I said, he's been on, on the bag and, and a few of the tour events as well, as well. And then I have a fairly, uh, oh, I lost my screen. Uh, I have a fairly good contingent of membership going back. I have at least 10 members going back and possibly 12 to 14. So I have, uh, some close friends, Curtis Chan is our men's golf association president. He and his wife have attended all seven of my prior major championships that I played in, and they were slated to go to the eighth last year when it was canceled, the senior. Uh, so they're going to be traveling with me a couple of weeks to, to uh, uh, attend number eight and nine for them as well. And then, like I said, I have some other members going back, but I, I'm so lucky. I have such a supportive membership here at the club not only from uh, emotional and, and congratulations and following online and texting. I didn't get a lot of text after the third round, but I got a heck of a lot after the final round uh, last week. Uh, so I have a good contingent, a good support system uh, heading back with me. Yeah, uh, Stuart, that's great. And what a thrill, what a thrill to have your sons uh, on the bag with you, you know, and we, and we saw that at Hilton Head when Stuart sinks Stuart Singh's son on, on the bag there, especially that they'll be with you pretty much two weeks in a row because you're here headed right from Kiowa uh, to Tulsa. Correct. Yeah. So uh, Stuart, again, congratulations on everything. And I, and I will say this, you know, just a sign of, of, of the, of the uh, professionalism of, of everyone, you know, texting you and I texted Brad to, to say congratulations after the final round and, and Brad texted back to me, uh, hey Len, thank you, but did you see what Stuart shot today? You know, and, and, and just to get that response from another player colleague is just, I think an, uh, the epitome of PGA professionals. And uh, as Mark said uh, earlier, yeah, they're trying to beat each other, but also respect of uh, colleagues and being professionals uh, playing in something very, very challenging. So Stuart, best, best to you and the family uh, traveling. Uh, get there safely. You've got a busy, busy couple of weeks and, and we'll just take it one day at a time. Thanks, Len. Mark and Brad, I'll see you there. Looking forward to seeing you there. And uh, if I can be of any help, uh, certainly don't hesitate to ask. But uh, thank you, everyone. Thanks again for the also the opportunity to speak and share some of the success. Thanks. Okay, thank you, uh, Stuart. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Brad. Uh, congratulations. Get there safely, and we'll see you there. Very, very, very well done. Very proud of you and uh, carrying the banner. So next up, uh, Craig Kessler, and Craig is our Director of Government Affairs for the Southern California Golf Association, and um, Craig has been our, our advisor, leader, step on the gas, take your foot off the gas, let's do this, but a lot has happened, Craig, in the past two weeks. And uh, particularly, you know, bring everybody up to speed on what we've put out in, in, in terms of the California Alliance for Golf about Assembly Bill 672, uh, which has fortunately come and gone. And then uh, 1346 and other things that, that we need to know. Craig, thanks for being here once again. Thanks, Len, for the introduction. I'm, I'm sorry that Stuart Smith just dropped off because I was going to tell him he's my hero at the age of 59 to qualify and play in the PGA championship is a uh, 
it gives me hope. It gives a lot of us hope. Congratulations to him, and obviously congratulations to everyone who's playing at Kiowa. Now uh, on to other matters. Um, Assemb uh, last Friday was uh, one of the deadlines in the California legislative session. Uh, bills have to pass uh, successfully through their committee of reference or committees of reference in the House in which they were introduced in order to remain alive for the rest of the 2021 session and have any chance, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> to become law at the beginning of 2022. With one of those bills is very much alive and well and will become law at the beginning of 2022. And I'll get to that one in a moment. One of the ones we're watching is AB 1346. But first up, one that's been, uh, on everybody's radar screen, one for which the SCGA and I think uh, both the NCPGA, the SCPGA, all the, all the alphabet soup in the state, uh, almost all the alphabet soup in the state that's under the California Alliance for Golf umbrella, uh, really uh, did a full court press on this one. And that was AB 672. Refresh everyone's memory. That was a bill that proposed to remove 22% of the state's golf courses. In other words, those publicly owned from the protections of the Public Park Preservation Act, in addition to remove, um, to make them, to do a quick start <clears throat> or an expedited process of immediately rezoning them uh, from, uh, from parkland to residential uh, without benefit, uh, with another exemption, without benefit of the protections of the California Environmental Quality Act for the purposes of turning them into housing tracks. Not just any kind of housing track, but a, a housing track that had a substantial affordable component. What that means is something is a moving target. That's, that's a different, that means something different in every jurisdiction. It's a very complicated formula. So what an affordable housing unit is in Beverly Hills, for example, is slightly different from, I don't know, let's say, uh, Panorama City. So um, that was, uh, we identified that as uh, a shot across golf's bow, as, pro as the most uh, consequential or dangerous bill to be introduced against the golf industry in, in a generate at least one generation, if not two or three. The good news is, there's good news and bad news with the bill. The great news is that it was our goal to see it not last past last Friday and it didn't. And it didn't even make it, it didn't even get scheduled for a hearing in one of the, in the main committee in which it was referred, which was housing and community development. Had it gotten through there, it still needed to get through the local government committee in order to remain alive for the remainder of the session. So it didn't have good reception. Uh, we had heard uh, through the grapevine that the author of the bill, was taken aback a little bit by golfers' reaction, felt we overreacted. And I don't know about you, but that brings a smile to my face if indeed we actually overreacted to something like that. And uh, she, the bill is obviously dead for the remainder of 21, but it will, she's, the author has stated she'll bring it back as a two-year bill. So it'll come back alive for about six weeks at the beginning of 2022. Uh, I'll simply say we'll remain vigilant I assume she'll bring it back substantially amended because clearly it ran into a lot of opposition in 2021. But two-year bills generally uh, have a generally are not very very successful. They're a little bit more face-saving uh, techniques for bill authors, or they allow the conversation to continue. And I think the author's also been quoted as stating that she threw this bill out there. She threatened to throw something out there similar two years ago in order to start. A conversation. And I think it's the conversation that is the bad news. Not the, the good news is that we had enough firepower uh, to react to this bill. And those of you who are listening on the call who were part of that firepower, um, you done good uh, for, your, for your golf club, for your community, and for the game of golf in the state of California. I do know that uh, we, we, we do believe that there was a massive uh, response, not just from the professional community and the GMs, but from the superintendents and, for, and the most important thing from um, real live golfers who live in districts and contacted their members of the state assembly and state senate to indicate they played golf and they didn't like the bill. We also believe, but we can't, haven't been able to verify it yet, we'll try later, 
that the author of the bill was also a little bit surprised that there was as much negative action from her district. Her district runs along the southeast corridor of Los Angeles County. And I think she believes something that way too many people believe in government and in every other walk of life in California and the other 49 states for that matter, that golf is just something that is played at the elite parts of town or country clubs. I mean, often, most people don't know that 70 to 80% of the in the United States is at public facilities. And I think she discovered that, uh, that a lot of her constituents uh, play golf, heard about this bill, cared about this bill enough to contact her and indicate that it was, they thought it was a bad idea. Again, all of that's good news, but the conversation should concern us because this bill may have been an overreach or an extreme reaction. And for that reason, it was easy to kill, but it represents a line of thinking that many hold that golf no longer merits the large amount of acreage that it encumbers to, in order to provide its services. Whether that acreage is in the public sector, that's what this bill aimed at, because that's publicly owned parkland. The argument goes that how many people play golf, it's roughly nine or 10% of the population. Of course, we have to argue that less than that percentage plays any other individual active recreational activity. So less than 10% of the population actually plays baseball or soccer or goes to public swimming pools, uh, less than 1%. Uh, uses equestrian centers, maybe a greater percentage use trail systems of all kinds, particularly hiking and walking trails. That's a little more generic, but it isn't that much higher than 10%. So unless public land is totally passive, that is it's just nothing more than an open park or a picnic area, it's all, every, every activity, golf's not, golf is not unique, in, is, a, is an activity of a subset of a subset. Yet for whatever reason, golf gets singled out way that, well, for example, tennis courts don't. And it, and it goes to the very heart of something I've talked about on these uh, broadcasts, that uh, the, the very thing that has served us so well in this pandemic, that when you break it down, we put 1.3 human beings on one acre of wide open space. That's a recipe for life, for an activity that's very safe in the pandemic. But it's also a recipe for a challenge that we have as an industry whether that challenge, and that challenge isn't going away because 72 went away, that challenge isn't going away because, uh, because efforts to change the property tax status, uh, the open space status of golf courses tend to also fail. It's going to keep coming back uh, in, in other milder, more intelligently crafted guises. And I think we need to use uh, the experience of 672 and the reaction that real live golfers in their communities had to it as something that we're gonna increasingly have to do more and more of like other communities long ago learned to do. You know, I often talk about golfers being uniquely passive and I, and I think it isn't because golf, there's something about golf or golfers that makes them passive. I think that golf had an incredible run of success for about 60 years after World War II that made us take for granted that we didn't have to do things that other communities have long known they had to do, and that is make their case, uh, get, their, get their point of view across, and get into the public arena and fight, for, and fight for their interests. We got a little lax in that because so many other institutions fought for us or because we were treated well. That, that started to collapse 15, 20 years ago, and I hope, and I do believe that we're starting to come to terms with how we deal with that uh, moving forward. So again, good news, 672 is dead and buried for the rest of the year. Bad news, it comes back briefly and probably come back in a better, in a, by better, I mean a more palatable form at the beginning of 2022. But it also opened up a conversation and put a little bit of our blood in the water about, the, about our claim to be able to encumber as much uh, property as we do in, in urban uh, California. The other bill we were paying, we pay close, we pay attention to a lot of bills, but we really focused intently, obviously, on that one. And there's a second one, AB 1346, which would be a, a bill in the legislature to direct the Air Resources Control Board to set a date certain by which the sale of gas-powered 
equipment would no longer uh, that uh, of 25 miles per hour or less would no longer be you'd be able to sell it in the state of California. You would be able to use it past that date. Certain the date on the bill is 2024. Obviously, that's a date that's subject to change during the amendment process. This bill did make it through the committee, albeit on a seven to three vote, and telling. One of those three negative votes was from a, a member of the majority, a Democrat, and much of the conversation hewed very closely to the to the letter that uh, the California Alliance for Golf filed on the bill, which wasn't opposition to the idea. The golf industry has long supported, well, uh, okay, has long supported the move from gas-powered equipment because the emissions are high, it's dangerous to the workers, the noise factor, and various, various other things to battery powered equipment. And we're gonna to continue to do that. And we've made clear that we don't oppose the basis of you know, the, the aim of the bill. Our problem is uh, oftentimes these mandates go into effect and, 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 and alternatives that are battery powered are simply not commercially available or fit for intended use. So, and that's very much the case for a lot of equipment uh, that we use. A Little bit earlier this morning, a contingent of the California Alliance for Golf, in this case led by the golf course superintendents because this is right up their alley and area of expertise. We're, we're, we were able to meet with the um, staffers in the author's office who were driving the bill. It was a very, very productive conversation. They are very cognizant of, of our concerns, not as manufacturers of equipment, as purchasers of it. And I think we got the message through that it's important to us that when that moment comes, when there, when 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 our our current gas powered equipment wears out, and we need to we need to get replacement, and the only replacement that's available is battery powered. That it, indeed it is available, and not just available, but available from more than one manufacturer. So we don't end up in a monopolistic situation in which the price is exorbitant, and it has to be available and fit for intended use. So much of our discussion had to do with the fact mowers, battery power, there are on the market, and I am aware, I'm not going to name which courses are that, that bought these, they tend to die out after six to nine months. They just don't work as it is now. Again, we were clear to the legislative office, and we're clear in Sacramento, that we're not, we don't manufacture the stuff, we don't have that subject matter expertise, we're buyers of the equipment, and so, and, and again, I think those comments were very well received by the office. Uh, they did explain to us that there's language in the bill that directs the Air Resources Control Board to, to, uh, to use feasibility standards, availability standards, and, and there's some flexibility built in that if uh, certain things can, are not going to be available in 2024, and that's for sale, not use. The use isn't banned. That's an important distinction. Then those things can be extended uh, per the rulemaking uh, process, and that's likely to happen. Our, our, our final uh, word with the office was that, let's make sure that language remains in the bill when it becomes law. And this one's almost 100% guaranteed uh, to become law because it's so consistent with what the political majority in Sacramento thinks. It's consistent with the governor's call to become uh, you know, emissions free by a certain date. It's consistent with everything that's going, been going on in California and will continue to go on. And I think, and I'm very optimistic that we will be protected in the final analysis, in the final bill, and so forth. But I think the both of these examples, whether 672, which was a full court press, uh, uh, just to uh, kill it as quickly as possible, or with this bill, which was to largely uh, focus any opposition that we had, had, has to do with a feasibility factor and a cost factor, and not a, and nothing to do with uh, it being opposed to the thrust of the intent of the bill. Both good examples of how the golf industry can or is able to in a way now that just a few short years ago it was not able to do. It's able to defend itself in the public arena and to be and to up its profile in Sacramento in such a way that, uh, as I've always said, anyone can, and I can pump them out a mile a minute, can write a beautiful argument against a piece of legislation or public policy. The trick is not writing those fancy analyses. The trick is that when you do it, people in government actually care what you think. And ever so slowly, too slowly for my taste, and I think a little too slowly for the long-term interest of the golf industry, uh, we're continuing to do that. But I think the California Alliance for Golf, I, I know the organizations on this call 
are certainly committed to doing their best to make sure that we can continue to have, in this case, what I would call are very clear and definite wins for the golf industry in the political arena. And for those of you who didn't think that was possible or who may be cynical, let me repeat that, very clear wins in the political arena. Most wins are just having your opinions heard and often having some of your concerns reflected in final legislation. Occasionally it's things like 672. I think there's no compromise with a bill like that. And for those who felt that 672, because it only applied to municipal golf courses, who felt that might not have affected the other 78% of the industry, I want to emphasize again, as I had during this entire uh, controversy, that the thinking and sort of the political niche that pushed this bill is far more upset about the property tax valuation basis of the state's private clubs and by implication the daily fee facilities than they were with the fact that there are municipal golf courses in communities where they think it would be better served, the communities would be better served by having them be housing tracks. And so that's something to uh, consider. And for anyone, and for anyone who hasn't heard Malcolm Gladwell's, I think it was a TED talk, but he turned it into a YouTube that went viral and it, its subtitle was Why I Hate Golf and You Should Too. That was uh, stimulated not by his dislike of the game, but it was stimulated by his offense at the property tax bill that a certain golf, a certain private club in Los Angeles uh, paid that he was denied entry to as a member of the public. So I want everyone to keep that in mind. These issues are related to each other. There's no distinction, just as with the water and the environmental issue, or whether you need to buy a chainsaw to knock your trees down. It doesn't matter whether you're a public course or a Cypress Point Golf Club. Um, you're affected the same. Water issues, we know everyone's in the same boat. And even though this issue appeared to draw a distinction, it really doesn't. The, the, connect, the nexus between, between the two is a very tenuous and close one. And so, suffice it to say that perhaps one could argue that by winning at the municipal level, it, may, it, it ensured at least uh, some years of surcease from attacks at, at the other levels of the game. I think I'll close out today with not about legislation, but our old favorite subject, we're almost to the finish line with COVID. I hope everyone on this call knows that California has the lowest infection rates in the United States. And it's arguable, it may very well be that the largest county in this state, Los Angeles County, be, uh, it, which just moved to the yellow tier uh, a couple of days ago, may indeed have the lowest uh, in, the, in the United States uh, because, it, it, because it may have the lowest in the state of California a remarkable turnaround, which ind indicates to me that we're very close to the finish line. We should have some optimism that when we do get to June 15th, the entire tier structure, the safer at home protocol, everything will be back, not to 100% of normal. There will still be a few restrictions, but I do anticipate that even those counties like Los Angeles that have stubbornly insisted on retaining a golf appendix, when I, the problem with that is that is that by retaining separate appendices in a way that I don't think the other 57 counties have it anymore. I know the other nine in Southern California don't. It means that every time there's a change in tier or a change in you know, the state relaxes rules, of course that affects enormous sectors and public health departments only have so much bandwidth. And so they don't get around to amending those golf appendices to make them consistent with everything else in rapid fashion. Uh, in anticipation of moving to the yellow tier, I reached out to some board offices in LA County, and I thought by the time I gave this broadcast, I would be able to share with you the changes in the uh, golf appendix in Los Angeles County. And the changes I anticipate have to do with finally at long last year in the, in the state's most populous county, permitting rakes and bunkers and real holes and flag sticks and benches and things like that. In addition, also hopeful of some relaxation uh, in the face coverings so that they're so that when out in the open air at least not in clubhouses and not in the immediate surrounds of clubhouses that at least uh, that face covering requirement might be removed I'm very optimistic on the former on the latter I'm not sure because even when LA County went to the yellow tier it went to it in such a way that it didn't go all the way as the state describes it it went almost the way whether that conservatism is why LA is doing so well, or whether it's just 
an unreasonable overreach. Uh, I think uh, eventually when uh, scholars study the reactions and all the mistakes we made in dealing with the pandemic, we'll get a clearer picture. At this point, early in the, in the pandemic, I felt it was prudence at some, for some period of time, and this is just an opinion, certainly no, I'm not an expert in the field. I think it's been a level of overreach, but in any case, uh, we're almost to the finish line in that. And uh, my final comment will be to everyone on this call, and golf got to that finish line pretty well and better than most sectors, and in large part because uh, golfers, GMs, those who work in the industry, those who do those in the ownership groups and the management groups really did pay heed to to pay in fact i would say that based on the emails i get have paid way too much attention to trying to be to strictly comply with every rule and regulation because for the most part in many cases you had to you had to decide what that rule or regulation was by arguendo or by implication because nothing was in black letter law so it's probably a credit to everyone in this industry that we erred on the side of extreme caution instead of uh, being a little bit looser. So maybe the, maybe the conclusion I can come up with is that maybe, maybe it's a good thing that I wasn't running a management company or managing one of the golf courses because I might have erred a little bit on the other side and messed it up for all of us. But uh, all of you should be, I think, pleased. And I think, and all, and, and it's nice to actually do one of these Fridays um, chats. And um, for the most part, be uh, the bringer of good news and not bad news. The only the only dark only storm cloud out there is remember we have a couple of existential challenges that are not going to go away just because we've been able to beat back certain things in the short run. We're going to continue along that vein to have to beat those things back. And with any luck, we'll come. We will take better control of the narrative about our industry and our team, so that at some point we won't have to beat back those things. And with that. Uh, Len, Tom, everyone on the call, thanks for inviting me. Thanks for listening. And um, I think I will um, yield back the floor, answer any questions if I raised it. Thank you, Craig. We did have one question, but you actually answered it when you talked about the uh, uh, protocols and such and the appendices changes in, in the Los Angeles County. Um, Craig, and as you mentioned this morning on our legislative call with CAG, that uh, the response was great regarding 672 and even a surprise, as you mentioned to uh, Christina Garcia about the response in her own district. As you said, she didn't think there were so many golfers. So uh, just an observation, Craig, and talking about AB5, which became 2257, which I believe is now 1850, 672 and 1346, uh, what they have in common is Lorena Gonzalez and Christina Garcia. Both of their names appear on all three or four of those. And um, what, what do you make of that? Are they just uh, set against golf or just doing something? No, I, I think that it, it, in the case of Christina Garcia, and we'll probably reach out to her, I think it's a deep misunderstanding of what golf is and who plays golf in California. And with Elena Gonzalez, I want to remind everyone on this call, her office was worked with us quite cooperatively on securing that business to business for professional services exemption that and, and, another, and one other exemption that pretty much there is nothing which re, that prevents. You have to rework some agreements, PGA golf professionals from working as independent contractors, youth coaches are specifically exempted. And it turns out something that I didn't think we would accomplish, and I was in on those meetings with uh, Assemblymember Gonzalez, uh, was, a, was a carved out a, a route for caddies to operate that way as well. That's a bit more of a convoluted route. So I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't associate, I, I, would, I would associate Assemblymember Gonzalez in San Diego as someone whose most passionate interest is labor and workers. And sometimes that intersects with some of some of our interests, but I, I don't I detect zero anti any sense of anti golf animus uh, from that office. And I know that uh, some professionals, uh, you know, accompanied me in, in meetings on both on telephone and in the office in the downtown San Diego office. And she was quite warm and said a lot of nice things about our industry. I will say she said no nice things about certain trucking industries and transportation. Uh, you know, apps, uh, but, she's, but she had a very positive sense. And I think we were able to educate her as to some municipal facilities that have done, like Chula Vista, have done some really good work 
in her community and have done some really good work in junior golf. And again, that, that's a record. When I made a mention that we should take better control of our narrative, I think we need to get those messages out about who we, what we, who we really are, what we really do, and, and, and those kinds of things. Because when we do, our stock goes up in everybody's estimation. But I, but, it, but, in, but I just didn't want to leave anyone with the sense that if, if we work it, if we get out of our little cubby holes and stop just talking to each other and talk to the greater world and talk to those persons who may have very different, in some cases, political viewpoints, social viewpoints, um, and, and different viewpoints about, about the world and how it works, they can be our friends too. Golf has made a terrible mistake in not reaching out that way. I personally, because I've had a passion, I've worked a lot in the municipal sector. That sector has a very, in many places, at least in the southern half of the state, not so much in the north, has a very, very warm, fuzzy view of golf and, and what it does in communities. And in those places where we've been active, I understand municipal golf courses are just a very specific kind of public park. They're not country clubs. That's not to denigrate country clubs. I love country clubs. But when you get the image that the, the publicly owned facility is a private facility and somehow the public, then things do not go well for us. So again, it's about being bold, not aggressive, but assertive about telling the world who we are, what we are, what we're about, what our record is. We've done a little bit better, quite, quite a bit better on the environmental front, particularly with you know, inputs and water. And, and maybe we focused on that because we, seen, we live in the land of permanent drought, but we've been a little bit remiss in not focusing actually the, the social good that golf courses bring in the communities in which they're located. And, and in addition, just pointing out that one of the reasons that communities often step forward and those communities are filled mostly, 90% of them are non-golfers to step up when a golf course is threatened because it adds value to their lives and perhaps a little bit more importantly, it, it adds value to whether it's a, home, a, a house, a condo or a townhouse. When you live in proximity to a golf course, it's worth more than if the golf course isn't there. We know that, but, they don't, but policymakers don't always know these things and we have to communicate those things and commu communicate them in a way where it's credible and honest, straightforward, which also means that there are certain things about our game that are not all that they may not uh, appreciate or enjoy. Be honest about those. Don't try to hide them. That's my, I'm sorry for the lengthy answer, but you teed that up. And uh, I do expect, I actually am optimistic that by close of business today, we will see a new LA County golf appendix. But I shouldn't have said that because if there's one, you know, if there's one governmental agency that never, that almost never misses an opportunity to disappoint, it's Los Angeles County Public Health. So I shouldn't have said that, but I said it, I'll let it stand. Well, thank you, Craig. And again, thank you for you know, going on well over a year, you and Kevin uh, keeping us up to speed and we appreciate the, the open and honest dialogue. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, just a great uh, session today, uh, having our, our qualifiers and uh, Craig with us and we'll start to wind down now and I'll toss it to our, our colleague and friend, uh, Tom Addis, Tom. Yeah, thank you, Lynn, and, and uh, thanks to everybody. Thanks in particular to Mark and Brad and Stuart and, and to Craig and, and Craig. Uh, certainly appreciate and echo your remarks about uh, letting everyone, letting people know, letting legislators know what we do, who we are, uh, and, and the good that we do. And that's something that uh, we need to practice and preach uh, continually, not just because of what's happened over the last year and a half, but ongoing. So uh, much appreciate those remarks. And uh, thanks to Caitlin, Bryce, Len, thanks to you. And uh, uh, hopefully you have a good, uh, good month, everybody. We'll see you on June 4th. And uh, uh, enjoy the day. Thanks, Len. Yeah, thanks, Tom. And, and again, thank you all for joining us today one more time. Happy Mother's Day uh, to all the moms out there. Please be sure to celebrate uh, with your families to our team, Southern California team, Northern California PGA team for having us on the air one more time. And as Tom mentioned, uh, we, you know, we're, we're, we're cheering for Mark and Brad and Stuart uh, at Kiowa. And of course, our next chat, June 4th, which will actually be the second round of the U.S. Women's Open at the Olympic Club. And then two weeks later, will be the Men's Open at Torrey Pines. So there's a lot going on uh, right here in our home state of California. 
uh, in both our sections and our championships uh, yet to come this summer in Nevada. So best to everyone. Please be healthy. Please be safe. And uh, we will see you and talk to you on June 4th. Thank you.